O.J. Simpson died at 76. That's where we're starting The Seven from The Washington Post. I'm Hannah Jewell. It's Friday, April 12th. Let's get you caught up with today's seven stories. Orenthal James Simpson died on Wednesday from cancer. Simpson rose from a poor neighborhood in San Francisco to become one of the greatest running backs in football history in the late 1960s and 1970s. He went on to become a fixture of TV, movies, and commercials. But his reputation as a high-achieving and amiable star was shattered in 1994. That's when he was accused of killing his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ronald Goldman. In their years together, Nicole had made multiple calls to police for protection from domestic violence. Simpson was the only serious suspect in the murders, although he always insisted he was innocent. His lawyers arranged for him to present himself for arrest, but he fled in a white Ford Bronco. This led to a dramatic police chase that ignited a media circus. Here's how that sounded from the archives of KTVU Fox 2. The presumed uh, vehicle of O.J. Simpson is still traveling very slowly northbound along the 5 freeway, uh, coming up again towards the 91 intersection. At that point, we'll just have to wait and see which way he's going to go, but... uh, At this point, it's uh, still a fairly laid-back situation, a dangerous situation at the same time. What followed became known as the trial of the century. Lasting eight months, it captured America's attention, but also exposed deep racial divisions. In October 1995, he was acquitted. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187, A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson. In 1997, Simpson lost a wrongful death civil trial related to the murders. And in 2008, he was convicted in a separate case of armed robbery, kidnapping, and conspiracy. He was sentenced to 33 years, but was released on parole in 2017. For more about Simpson's life and legacy, check out yesterday's episode of Post Reports wherever you listen to podcasts. Number two. The Biden administration canceled another $7.4 billion in student loans. The White House will send emails today to 277,000 borrowers, informing them that their debts are being cleared. Most of the relief will go to borrowers enrolled in President Biden's Saving on a Valuable Education Plan, also known as SAVE. That plan ties monthly student loan payments to earnings and family size. Biden has now approved $153 billion in loan forgiveness for nearly 4.3 million people. As Election Day nears, the Biden administration has ramped up efforts to wipe out education debts. That's despite Republican challenges to those efforts and the Supreme Court striking down his broader relief plan last year. Number three. The U.S. complained that Israel didn't warn it about a strike on Syria. This month, Iran said that an Israeli strike on its consulate in Damascus killed senior Iranian commanders. U.S. officials said Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin complained to his Israeli counterpart that the U.S. wasn't told about the strike. They said it increased the risk to U.S. forces in the region, and knowing about it ahead of time would have let the Pentagon heighten defenses. Iran has threatened retaliation against Israel. The U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem warned its employees yesterday to remain in designated areas because of the threat. This episode is just the latest sign of strain between the U.S. and Israel. Number four. Harvard will once again require test scores for admission. Harvard was one of many colleges that went test-optional when the coronavirus pandemic shut down testing sites across the country. But that's about to change. Students applying for admission in fall 2025 will have to submit standardized test scores as part of their application. Harvard announced this yesterday. Other colleges have also been updating their pandemic-era testing policies. Dartmouth, Yale, and Brown have announced similar changes. The schools cite new research that suggests SAT and ACT scores are the best predictors of student performance. But the announcements are stressing out students who weren't expecting standardized tests to return. (music) 
Shohei Otani's interpreter was accused of stealing $16 million from him. That's number five. This is the latest development in a scandal that has rocked baseball since the start of the season last month. Yesterday, federal prosecutors charged Ipe Mizuhara with bank fraud. They accused him of siphoning off millions from Otani's accounts to pay off huge gambling debts. The indictment appeared to vindicate Otani, who plays for the Los Angeles Dodgers and is one of baseball's brightest stars. Federal prosecutors said that Otani was a victim in this case, and they accused Mizuhara of abusing his position of trust for theft. Number six. Soon, you won't have to pay as much to get your broken iPhone fixed. Starting this fall, owners of an iPhone 15 or newer will be able to get their devices fixed with used parts, without losing any features or getting on-screen warnings. Apple's move was reported by The Post yesterday. Until now, people with broken iPhones have had three options. They could get it repaired using expensive new replacement parts from Apple, or they could get parts made by third-party suppliers or secondhand parts pulled from other iPhones. But the last two options meant the parts wouldn't work exactly the same as the originals. That's going to change. This is good news if you can't afford Apple Store prices for out-of-warranty repairs, or if your most convenient repair option is some random guy at a local repair shop. And at number seven, three castaways were rescued after writing help on a beach with palm leaves. Three experienced sailors were fishing near a tiny Pacific island last week when things took a worrying turn. Their motor got damaged and stopped working, leaving them stranded on the uninhabited island. They managed to survive for more than a week eating coconuts and drinking water from a well. They were reported missing last weekend, which sparked a search of over 78,000 square nautical miles. Luckily for them, a U.S. Navy aircraft spotted their help sign. And on Tuesday, a U.S. Coast Guard ship went to pick them up. They're all in good health. Officials said their decision to make the huge help sign was pivotal in the rescue. So now you know what to do if you ever find yourself stranded on a desert island. That's the show for this week. The assistant producer of The Seven is Taylor White. The staff writers are Jamie Ross and me. John Taylor is our editor. Additional editing by Christina Quinn. Copy editing is by Francis Moody, Thomas Haliba, and Melissa No. Mixing and sound design is by Jim Briggs and Justin Garish. Our theme music is by Edith Mudge. Renita Jablonski is our director of audio. I'm Hannah Jewell. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend. I'll meet you back here on Monday. <laughs>